I believe in the power of dreams, like most of you, but I'm also fond of taking risks, unlike most of you. And these risks can bring unbelievable rewards, and they can be surprising. So I'm going to tell you today about the confluence of two streams of dreams and faith, and uh, how they came about in the most unlikely way. I'm not so sure I believed in the power of prayers, but I prayed anyway. Dear God, please give me an exciting life, a life worth living. After sending my thoughts into the ether, I promptly forgot what I asked for. After all, I'd always imagined that God was too busy taking care of white people's prayers and probably won't get to mine. To my surprise, my prayers were answered, and I was reminded of it years later. When I think of home, my mind's eye always pictured the mountains of Guizhou province in southwest China. Endless lush green hills nestled together, the top so pointy as if some giant had taken a pencil sharpener to each of them. The air thick with the scent of pine needles, peach fuzz rain, so fine it blended into the air, soaking your skin and filling your lungs. I often wonder if that's what's it like to be a fish, but of course, a fish wouldn't know better because it wouldn't have expected anything other than the vastness of the ocean. As for me, I couldn't have imagined anything other than home until I landed in the dry desert of New Mexico, United States, 19 years later. I was born in Waterloo, Iowa. My dad, Joseph, was a sculptor. My mom, Ruth, was an opera singer before she had my three sisters and me. My family lived in an art-filled home. My dad immersed us in his world of art at his studio in Rome, Italy, and at home. Dad's creative side was tempered by his wartime experience in World War II Europe, where he'd served as a combat engineer. Dad's company came upon an UNRWA camp for Jewish survivors. He discovered and rescued his mom's niece, who had been held in Fernwald concentration camp and helped her settle in Palestine. Dad then stayed for a year at the UNRWA camp, helping settle Jewish orphans. Dad's rescue of both family and strangers touched me deeply. When I was 16, I visited those cousins thriving in Israel. One cousin gave me a book by the science fiction author Robert Heinlein, and that book planted in my mind the idea that someday my lovingly handcrafted animations I'd been doing up to then might someday be made using computers. I had fallen in love with animation watching Disney's Fantasia as a child, and my dad taught me flipbook animation to absorb my excitement. Once I fell in love with the art in science, I set high goals to become a medical illustrator. After medical school ended, I ended up as a senior medical illustrator at the Yale School of Medicine. I've always known that my family was different. There were many hushed conversations and meaningful glances over dinner tables. We had secrets, pretty straightforward secrets. My grandparents were landowners and dissidents during the Cultural Revolution. As a red-hot communist ideal spread across the land, everything any capitalist holds dear was looked down upon. The rise of a new empire inevitably come from the ashes of the previous one. Wealth and education, old world measures of excellence became marks of disrepute. After enjoying generations of wealth and prosperity, the crown no longer protected my family. Like many other dissidents at the time, my grandparents were exiled inland to the fringes of society to live, to die, to be forgotten. In 1984, I left Yale at the pinnacle of my profession to follow a lifelong dream of becoming a real animator. Medical animation was not a thing back then, so leaving Yale was a risk. Riskier still was starting the first digital medical animation company in the world before I had actually learned to use or touched a computer. My high ideal was to become a medical animator who would reimagine how to visualize science and medicine without sacrificing truth or beauty in the process. I have that challenge still today. This fortune has a tendency to seep from one generation to another along strong cultural paths of family ties. Ideals of revolutionary conflict became personal vendettas. Trapped in their environment, my parents were unable to build a hopeful life for themselves. Systematic prejudice led to chronic financial distress. 
I, on the other hand, had a difficult time integrating into the highly political education system. Through my grandparents and my parents' eyes, I was able to look behind the curtain and form my own perspective on events that crushed us while raising others. Unable to echo perfectly the government directive on school essays and daily life, my teachers put a target on my back. My parents didn't have the money to bribe my teachers to make my life better. Yes, bribing teachers on behalf of one's kids was a common practice. I was experiencing public humiliation in front of classmates on a daily basis. Defiant and unyielding, I invited more attention from my teachers and things became personal for them. Eventually, egged on by my principal teacher, I was physically assaulted by my classmates under the guise that I was a person of loose morals. Things were getting out of my teacher's control and more physical threats were made by enthusiastic students who were eager to please. To protect me, my parents supported my wild but necessary decision to drop out of school at the risk of erasing all of my education records, which are crucial in attending universities, finding a job, and participating in any other activities of social life. In essence, dropping out of school erased me from society. This had other huge costs. It's illegal to not finish compulsory education and if found out my truancy would put my parents' livelihood in jeopardy and also force me back into a system that had harmed me. After lying to the school and stealthy departure with my parents, I was at age 13, no longer a student, no longer a member of society, and no longer existed in a government sense. My days in hiding had begun. Without the traditional funnels of life paths, I had no idea what my future might hold in a system that does not protect me. Despite the danger and uncertainties, ostracization has its perks. No longer having to memorize the party line, I chose to teach myself English and was eventually able to revel in a world of literature, arts, and science. I battled with my anxiety and depression with Shakespeare. His words, though often sorrowful, give me courage. We are such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with a sleep. I found comfort in my melancholy and I made friends with uncertainty. I had hoped that through my own effort, I would be able to find a place to exist in this world. Not giving up on living the biggest life possible, I would sneak out at appropriate moments to participate in competitions and volunteering. I never expected that my risky dilly-dallying would change my life. In 2005, my team was invited by the Director of Molecular and Cellular Biology at Harvard University to collaborate in creating the most sophisticated and detailed animation on cellular function ever attempted. We brought cinematic aesthetics to the classroom. The project, which I named The Inner Life of the Cell, eventually inspired millions of imaginations of students and non-students around the world. It elevated my career to a higher plane than I had ever thought possible, an invitation to the 2007 TED conference to give a talk. I loved my time volunteering for my city's new AYCC Animation Festival in 2007. However, in 2008, a new rule barred me from doing volunteer translation work. Only college students were welcomed, and I would never be a college student in China. Behaving like a teenager, I gatecrashed the festival's party and boarded the speaker's tour bus, wearing last year's volunteer shirt. In 2008, I was inspired, invited to speak at the AYACC Animation Festival in Guiyang, China. I really cherish these invitations to be able to meet new international colleagues and experience exotic surroundings. I did not expect this invitation to change my life. One conference day was reserved for presenters to take a tour of beautiful Guizhou province. We were to walk behind one of the great waterfalls of the world around tranquil temple-dotted lakes and through ancient sculpture gardens, equally ancient bonsai trees, and I had just settled down in my seat on the bus when a Chinese girl came up to me and in beautiful British English, quite unlike the language of the student guides I had met in Guiyang, she asked me a question. May I sit with you? Absolutely. This is going to be a long bus ride. My name is David, what's yours? I told David my name is Shang Yi and then proceeded to correct his pronunciation several times before giving up. 
understanding that I should not be on the bus and seeing a conference organizer doing a final headcount, I decided to blend in by chatting up with my new friend. Only recently acquainted with the concept of small talk, I thought it would be a brilliant idea to ask him a question to start a conversation. So I turned to David and asked, do you know the derivation of the word anti-disestablishment terrorism and how it might apply to China today? After I got my jaw off the floor, I answered Changi's question, and over the next several hours, we continued to talk about people watching and cloning, censorship, nuclear power, fashion, and philosophy. I was quite astounded. Changi was unexpectedly kind and attentive when I felt motion sick on the bus. She went to the front of the bus and came back with a moist towel and water for me. That helped. I've been mentoring smart, talented kids for decades, but this young lady was quite beyond anyone I had ever encountered. She lived in constant stress after leaving school under threats to her safety at 13 and going into hiding. Changi had won the regional Guiyang English contest, but was prevented from going on to Beijing to compete in the nationals because she was considered a ghost, no longer a student. So Changi doubled down and learned the soul of Shakespearean English by memorizing entire Shakespeare plays and sonnets. She also mastered the complex instrument, the zither, alone in her room. She was brimming with philosophical questions. I'd really never met anybody like her, especially one who used thee and thou as if they were modern. I knew that Shang Yi, having crashed the party, wouldn't get that opportunity again. She was unlikely to meet many people with the ability to help her. I realized also that if I didn't offer her some hope and Shang Yi disappeared on me, I would regret it for the rest of my life. So 12 time zones away from my dear wife, Patty, and with my dad's cousin echoing in the back of my head, I offered to help this young lady come to the States, and I promised to give her a proper education. David's offer to help was unbelievable. It is still incomprehensible to me today why he made such a decision that caused so much trouble to him for so many years. The truth was, I had half expected that he would one day disappear and become a figment of my imagination. My parents, on the other hand, believed in him and his promise. Speaking no English and knowing no other world than the one they grew up in made the hardest and most counterintuitive decision in their entire life to put their only child in the care of a complete stranger. This took incredible courage and faith in the goodness of other people, despite their own experience. For the following years, David brought me books I had no access to and became very much a mentor, a guide, and a parent. It took me three and a half more years and three more trips back to China, one of them with my younger son, Alexander, to figure out how to get Chang Yi to the States. My friend Michael Hawley, who curates the EG Conference in Monterey, California, invited Chang Yi to give her U.S. performance debut on the zither at EG. With an engraved invitation in hand, she was still unable to get a U.S. visa. None of my visits to private and public high schools in the States could convince them to accept a poor Chinese girl who had no academic records. It was really frustrating. Six months after Shang Yi took the SAT in Hong Kong, we returned in Hong Kong in 2011 and met with friends at the Polytechnic University. I met an American expatriate named Lon Hodge who suggested that Shang Yi apply to St. John's College in Annapolis, Maryland. St. John's Great Books Program is world renowned in academic circles for its challenge. Lon said, you know, they would recognize the path that Shang Yi took to educate herself. 
She practically invented her own great books program alone in her room. So that was our glimmer. That was our hope. That evening, as we walked along the Hong Kong waterfront, passing the statue of Bruce Lee, Shang Yi asked to stop. After so many years of calling you sir, may I start calling you dad now? I said yes. My tears surprised me. We both had taken risk to be at this spot together. We had both followed our hearts, and we both trusted that what needed to happen would indeed happen. My recital from A Midsummer Night's Dream, where Hermia and Lysander plot to flee Athens, seemed appropriate to include in my college application. St. John's College was indeed the charm. They offered me an 80% scholarship. I enrolled in January 2012 in their Santa Fe campus and graduated three years and a half later. I also was finally able to fulfill my wish to go to the UG conference in Monterey, California, where I performed. One of the greatest thrills of my life was Patty, my wife, and me watching Chang Yi fulfill her promised education goal and graduate from St. John's in 2015. Later that year, I was asked to create an animation for Estee Lauder of their new flagship product. I was thrilled to take on the challenge, and when I found out there was no cover girl, I asked if I might hire my daughter. My client chuckled, no, this is for the Asian rollout. I showed him pictures of Shang Yi, and we got the okay. <laughs> it was like a Cinderella day being able to professionally collaborate with my daughter, and it felt as though we had been practicing for years. Since my graduation in 2015, I've experienced dramatic world political change that affected me personally. I was one of the lucky few. After our arduous immigration process, I was finally able to take up permanent residence in the States, and enjoy the possibility to work and live a normal life. At the same time, I realized that my story, though singular, has broader implications throughout human experience. I'm working on documenting my journey in a memoir in the hopes of bringing hope to our current uncertain world. Today, I leave you with words from Emily Dickinson, and may it inspire joy in your heart. Hope is the thing with feathers, a purchase in the soul, and sings the tune without the words and never stops at all. Thank you all so much. <laughs>